Good morning and welcome to the Oasis Global Gathering. My name's Steve Chalk and I'm the founder of Oasis as well as one of the ministers of Oasis Church in Waterloo, central London. It's often said nowadays that we're all in the same storm, exactly the same storm, but that we're not in the same boat. So how's the first week of 2021 been for you? Though most of us were very, very keen to leave 2020 behind, the third decade of the new millennium seems to have started off exactly where the second one left off. This week, aside from the truly shocking and distressing news from America, we've witnessed the speed and spread of the transmission rate of the new variant forms of the virus. We've seen its impact on so many people's livelihoods and on their physical, their emotional and their mental health. We've witnessed the pressure on the NHS as well as on care and other key workers or critical workers as they're now known since we left the EU. The initial impact that leaving the EU has had on so many small and medium sized businesses has been enormous as they struggle in the midst of all the other pressures on them to get their heads round how to deal with the new regulations and the paperwork. And the news that schools won't be fully open for some time, with all the various and complex strains and the stresses that that places on so many families. But in the midst of all this pressure, on Friday there was another breakthrough as a third Covid vaccine was finally approved. Yeah! But if you think that all this kind of turmoil is, is new to the 21st century. Let's pause for just a moment to listen to some of the words of the ancient poem that we call Psalm 22. It's the one that Jesus reminded himself of and focused on in his most troubled moment. These words can only be described as one of the most honest prayers ever written. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me, deliver me, rescue me. I recommend that if you get a chance just for yourself later today to read that psalm again, Psalm 22, it's some time well invested. Now, for our Connect slot this week, Nathan Jones has been talking to Brian McLaren, the American author, best-selling author, pastor and speaker, who's been a good friend to me for many years. Brian has just published a new book. It's called Faith After Doubt. And just like anything that Brian writes, it's filled with insight, wonderful theology and down-to-earth common sense. Hi, Brian. It's really great to see you. and Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I've just got a few questions about the book, which we've just been talking about on the Global Gathering. Um, the first is that in the introduction to the new book, uh, I read this great quote that you put on there from an old theologian, Paul Tillich, who said, uh, sometimes I think it's my mission to bring faith to the faithless and doubts to the faithful. Yeah. Um, and I remembered hearing Pete Rollins, who's a philosopher and an author who you'll know well, well. Uh, Pete was talking about the days when he worked as a charismatic evangel evangelist a long time ago now uh, and he said getting people to believe is easy it's like shooting fish in a barrel but getting them to doubt that's much more difficult. Could you talk to us a little bit about the book and what you think about those quotes? Yes well uh, of course doubt is super painful for a lot of people first because just within our own psyche uh, you know, reorganizing our thinking is always difficult. In fact, it, it causes anxiety, it causes depression, 
it's hard to do, but then add to that the social dimensions of it that, you know, our parents or our grandparents or our congregation, when we start asking questions and say, I'm not so sure about that, they become very anxious and, and sometimes even make threats. And soon they're talking to us about dangling us over the fires of hell, you know, um, for rethinking some little uh, topic of, of theology. So it's, it's a really, really difficult thing. It's a really, really challenging thing. So when Peter says it's hard, yes, uh, psychologists tell us of something called confirmation bias and, and our brains work to maintain equilibrium. They want to be very efficient. And if a new idea comes in that might disrupt our equilibrium, our brains just want to swat it away before we even consider it. So it, it is difficult, but here's the problem. It's really, really important. And this is why Paul Tillich said, sometimes we have to bring doubt to the faithful. Uh, you know, it wasn't very long ago where nearly all churches agreed that only men could be leaders. Um, thank God for some people who were willing to doubt that. It wasn't that long ago um, and still is true in so many places where people stigmatized LGBTQ persons Thank God for a few people who are willing to doubt that. But if you even go back to the New Testament, um, one of the verses that really sort of rises up in importance for me after writing this book is something Paul said in, in uh, Galatians 5. He said, all of the things that we argue about, and in his day it was circumcision versus uncircumcision, or what kind of foods you eat. And we, we would have a million issues today. All of the things we argue about don't mean a thing. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. Well, if that's the case, then all these things we've been arguing about, we have to at the very least doubt their importance <laughs> or, or, we, or we remain stuck. Um. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, so we're going to do this book club uh, over six weeks. Uh, we're going to start in February uh, and then we're going to run through to the 1st of April. And you're going to join us uh, on Zoom for that last session on the 1st of April, which we're all really excited about. Um, there's obviously a lot for us to learn as we go through this book. And one last question from me. What have you learned yourself during the writing oh, of this book? You know, it's one of the best things when you're a writer, when as you're writing, you feel that, wow, oh, I never saw that clearly before. And that happens in all of my writing, but boy, it happened a lot in this book. And one of the big issues that I've seen, and obviously you can imagine why this would be important to me being an American in this time in our history, is the relationship between religion and authoritarianism. And I've come to see that religious communities that won't let people doubt and ask questions end up serving as aggregators for authoritarianism because they teach people how to suppress their honest questions. And I hate to say it, but they teach people to pretend they agree with powerful, confident, usually men who are telling them what to do. And as the more I ponder that, the more I realize I don't think that's what Jesus was about. And I certainly don't think that's what we need right now at this time in our world. So uh, that's one, one of the uh, important insights. Do you think there's, um, there's a chink of light now? We talk um, now 24 hours after the Reverend Warnock has been elected in Georgia. Um, there's a new president on its way. Do you feel more positive about, um, about religion in the States and how that relates to public service? Well, you know, uh, w thank God we, uh, it, it, you know, for a long time here, uh, religious and right always went together. Uh, Christian and right wing always went together. And um, now I think people always know there's this other force in, in, uh, in the Christian faith that has a very different face, a very different demeanor, a uh, very different vision. So I think that's real progress that we've made. But I think we're at this difficult inflection point, not only in my country and your country, but really in the world. Uh, we're having to, we're having to, have, we're having to doubt the basic contracts that we built an entire civilization upon. Uh, climate change is forcing us to do that. 
COVID is forcing us to do that. And so uh, I think whenever people are put into a position where they, they need to rethink and change, it's going to be stressful. And I don't think our stress can be solved by a single election or whatever, but I do think the pieces are in place to build the kind of momentum that we need, a new kind of faith, a new kind of Christianity that is related to new approaches to government and politics and ecology and uh, economics and so on. And thank God for communities like yours, uh, like Oasis that are leaders in this and, uh, and they're springing up all around the world. That's a nice positive note on which to end. Thanks so much for your time this morning. We really look forward to getting into this book um, and then we look forward to chatting to you about it once we've done uh, a few weeks on it as well. Thanks so well, much. I should, just, I should just say it's an honour to me that you would do that. I, I trust that people will find important things for their own life, for your life as a community, and I look forward to uh, joining you at the end of the process. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Nathan. Now, Brian's going to be the speaker on our global gathering on Sunday, February the 21st. But as you've just heard, we're also going to be running a Zoom book club looking at Brian's latest book, his new book, for six weeks, which begin on Thursday evenings at 8 p.m. And all of this starts on February the 25th. And Brian is going to be joining us for the last one on April the 1st. So if you'd like to be part of this, you can sign up by emailing us at welcome at oasiswaterloo.org. That's welcome at oasiswaterloo.org. So don't miss out. And even more than that, we've been able to negotiate a special £3 off discounted price for Brian's book, <laughs> which you can access at oasiswaterloo.org slash book offer. And that will take you straight through to the bookshop where you can buy it. Now, changing the subject. As we all know, educating children safely is one of society's number one priorities. The lack of classroom learning means all children suffer, all children. And those who suffer most are those from the most disadvantaged situations. But because we, Oasis runs 53 schools, we believe that the only way to get all children back into school as soon as possible, which is what everyone wants, is to ensure that all school staff are prioritised and moved to the top of the list for the vaccine, along with NHS and care workers, for one of the three vaccines now available. All school staff are critical workers and all school staff need to feel safe and be safe. So if you agree with this and if you think it's important, please sign our national vaccinesforschools.org petition. But we want to do more than that. According to the World Health Organization, the wealthiest countries of the world have already procured most of the effective vaccines. And that, they say, means that Although a vaccine only costs around £2, 9 out of 10 people in the world's poorest countries will not be vaccinated this year and many of them will not be vaccinated next year or even the year after that. So, as you sign the petition to move all staff, all school staff, up the vaccine list in this country, please also consider giving two pounds, just two pounds or more, to support the World Health Organization's target of distributing two billion vaccines to poorer countries this year. To get involved, just go to vaccineforschools.org. Thank you. That would mean a lot. Now, in a moment, Rebecca Gibson, who's part of the staff team in Waterloo, is going to continue the new series of talks, which we've called Growing Together. It's based on the Apostle Paul's letter to the fledgling church based in the city of Corinth, which in the New Testament is known as 2 Corinthians. But first, Caroline Bryant 
is going to read to us from chapter 3 and verses 4 to 12 of that letter. Two Corinthians three verses four to twelve and eighteen. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. She has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I wonder what comes into your mind when you think of the words formation or discipleship. This may be cynical, but for me, it's often the setting of an impossible standard, a to-do list to ensure I become the right sort of follower of Jesus, or stick to beat myself with, or that others will. And then the crippling sense of fear and inadequacy when I ultimately fail at the impossible task I've set myself. Maybe if you grew up in church, this sounds familiar. And if you didn't, the whole notion of formation in a church context may be entirely alien to you. So we're going to look into formation a little more this morning through the lens of Paul and his letter in 2 Corinthians. First, a brief recap of what Nath told us last week. The book we read from today is the second of two letters Paul wrote to a church in Corinth. Paul had started the church there, but then things went a bit awry. Corinth was a thriving and growing city that had its struggles, arguments, false teaching and sexual immorality. So Paul wrote to the church, mainly to challenge this behaviour. After this, some unrest grows in Corinth against Paul, claiming him as a false apostle and a thief. So he writes another letter to challenge the church again and to defend himself. 2 Corinthians is a challenging letter, but Paul cares deeply about the church. It's a letter designed to get the church to gather together, to get everyone to commit again to following Jesus. Everyone has a part to play. This message is for the whole community. The other thing to note about Paul's second letter to the Corinthians is that it is pretty convoluted, even cryptic in parts. Theologians and academics agree on this. The passage we read today talks of old and new covenants and about life by the spirit, not by the letter. And then there's all this funny stuff about veils. But Paul's point, we think, here in chapter three, is that he's imploring the church to live by God's spirit in the way of Christ, not the ways of the Old Testament law, which were hindering the church. Paul isn't dismissing the importance of the Old Testament laws. They have purpose and meaning. But as theologian Ernest Best puts it, the old law lacks permanent validity. The old rules had their purpose and time and they maintain importance. But the church in Corinth has a new covenant, new information, new freedom and new light in the person of Jesus. I think I may have said before on a global gathering, I'm someone who loves rules, order and a to-do list. This has its uses, but also its limitations. I can lack a flexibility that would enable me to live more fully. And I wonder how often the church has tied itself to the rule book, to our own detriment and to that of those around us. 
Instead, I think when we experience and choose to follow the love of Jesus, rather than rules for their own sake, we're able to be changed and to live life to the full. But this doesn't mean life will be easy or that our characters will perfect themselves overnight. Formation by its very nature is something we have to work out continually throughout our lives. A cold January day in the middle of lockdown, after almost a year of a pandemic, seems like a tricky time to be talking about formation. But the reality is that our characters are being formed all the time. Paul was someone who knew hardship and difficulty and didn't shy away from it or dismiss it, but knew it would be a part of his life. Just one chapter before the one we read from today, Paul says this, we're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. A life following Jesus doesn't mean a life without hardship, but it is a life of hope. So what does formation look like as we seek to follow Jesus? I like the Episcopal Church's definition of formation, which says Christian formation is the lifelong process of growing in our relationship with God, self, others and all creation. Every experience in our lives can provide us with the opportunity to express our faith. The challenge we face is recognising these opportunities and learning ways to live a sometimes counter-cultural life. How do we recognise these opportunities to express our faith and to grow? At Oasis, we use the nine habits as a lens to view formation throughout everything we do, our schools, church, youth work. These habits are being compassionate, patient, humble, joyful, honest, hopeful, considerate, forgiving and self-controlled. They're based on the fruit of the spirit found in Paul's letter to the Galatians. This fruit is what we'll see if we live by the Spirit of God. But it's fruit that needs to be worked out, formed into habits and throughout our whole lives, with the goal of becoming more like the person of Jesus, more closely aligned to the story we have chosen to live by. I think a key in this is that there's no right path to spiritual formation or growth. Instead, it's about finding practices and tools that can help us develop and grow, both individually and as a community. We'll talk more about our growth as whole communities in the coming weeks, but I want to talk a bit more specifically about our personal growth, although community is vitally important for this too. I thought about some principles that have helped me and I hope they might help you too. Firstly, to explore different practices and find what helps you. Is it an early morning run or late night reading? A walk with someone, a book group, a podcast, a silent prayer, a noisy song, a journal entry, a liturgy, building something in your garden. For me, I know I develop best through conversation with others, through reading and through reflective writing. And I'm never going to be someone who can sit and quietly pray on my own for half an hour because I can't sit still for that long. But I think it's a great practice, maybe one I should challenge myself with, but not one that's going to be a key part of my regular practices because I just can't quite do it. It doesn't fit with my personality. Secondly, don't go it alone. Have you ever tried to do something really hard on your own? One of my proudest ever achievements was doing the London Triathlon in 2015. I signed up on a whim, unable to swim a length of front crawl, not owning a bike and being halfway through a couch to 5k. I think if I hadn't told my housemates and some friends I was going to do it, and if they hadn't nudged me on the way, I'd have given up after those first few embarrassing, clumsy lengths of the pool. And I think the same applies in our faith journeys. There's a need to be open with those that we trust, not to heap shame or pressure on us, but to share the struggles and the joy and to learn together. Thirdly, we need to have grace for the journey. We can learn from mistakes and difficulties and getting things wrong. I've lost count of the number of times this year that I've thought about a conversation afterwards, after I'd had it, and known that it really hadn't reflected the best of my character. But we follow a God of love and there is grace for us all as we journey. Finally, I think we need to continually remind ourselves of the story we are part of, 
A story that is much bigger than us, yet brings very tangible meaning to our lives. Through our journey together, may we cling to the hope we find in the story of Jesus. And I hope as we journey through this difficult time together, we will all find ways, however big or small, to grow in our relationship with God, self, others and all of creation. So in the light, what we've just heard from Rebecca, what she's just said, I invite you to pause as we take just a few moments to reflect on her words. There are four questions I'd like us to consider. The first is this. What did you hear that resonated with your experience? What habits could you work at this year which would help you in terms of your development as a person aligned more with the example and the life of Jesus? Just like the Apostle Paul, we can learn a lot from our hardships. What are you learning? at the moment. Who do you know who could help support and encourage you on this journey? Well, that's just about it for this week. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll be here at the same time, in the same place, next week. But as we close, I invite you to listen again to the familiar words of our closing song, which is really another prayer, one of praise to God. There's freedom, though you've captured me. Give me joy deep in my soul. There's beauty in my brokenness I've got true love instead of pain There's freedom, though you've captured me I've got joy instead of mourning There's beauty in my brokenness I've got true love instead of pain there's freedom though you've captured me I've got joy instead of mourning And you give me joy Down deep in my soul Down deep in my soul Down deep in my soul And you give me joy Down deep in my soul Down deep in my soul Down deep in my soul I've got true love instead of pain There's freedom though you've captured me I've got joy instead of mourning And you give me joy Down deep in my soul Down deep in my soul Down deep in my soul And you give me joy Down deep in my soul So free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart alone. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your and you give me joy down deep in my soul. Down
soul and you give me joy 